Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, and actually the next couple, we're actually going to be discussing a very important topic in the urinary system, and that is the juxtaglomerular apparatus, or JGA. Now, the juxtaglomerular apparatus is extremely important for both maintaining glomerular filtration rate, but also for regulating whole body blood pressure. But also, I think it tends to be one of the hardest topics to learn conceptually in A&P 1 and 2. So we're going to take it over the course of several videos, take it slow, and hopefully get a sense of what it does. All right, so there are two major parts of the juxtaglomerular apparatus. One is called the macula densa. Sometimes we say the macula densa cells. And the other part is called the JG cells. JG stands for juxtaglomerular. Uh, these are often called granular cells. So if you see the term granular cells, that means the same thing as juxtaglomerular cells. We'll cover this in the second video. Here we're going to look at just the macula densa cells. Now before we go any further, Let's actually take a look at the entire nephron right here. Okay. So this is the entire nephron. Right here in the box, we pretty much have the renal corpuscle, and of course the glomerular capillaries are inside that. Again, all the contents of the box are blown up right here. So we can see the capsule, we can see the glomerular capillaries, and of course the afferent arterial feeding these capillaries, and then the efferent arterial draining them. Of course, from the renal corpuscle, anything that's filtrated goes through the proximal convoluted tubule, down here through the descending loop of Henle, across the loop, up the ascending loop of Henle, and then, of course, through the distal convoluted tubule. Now, when we covered all of this tubule system separately in each video, I tended to draw them separately as if they're all isolated from each other. So there's our PCT, here's our loop of Henle, there's our DCT and collecting ducts, right? But in reality, if we take a look at this picture, this is more what it looks like. Uh, yeah, the, the loop of Henle is all the way down here, but notice the distal convoluted tubule loops back up and actually makes physical contact with the renal corpuscle, okay? Now, what's important to understand here, there's a region of the distal convoluted tubule, and really it's a region at the interface between the ascending limb of the loop and the distal convoluted tubule. That region where it makes contact with the renal corpuscle, there's specialized cells here. You can see them in purple uh, as part of the lining the lumen of the DCT. These are the macula densa cells. They kind of look purple in this image. Okay. Now, the macula densa cells, if you look this up in most sources, it'll say they're part of the distal convoluted tubule. But like I said, they're really at the interface between where the ascending limb actually kind of merges and becomes the distal convoluted tubule. Here it even says the ascending limb. Okay. The point is most sources will say DCT, but it's only this region where it makes contact with the renal corpuscle. And these are your uh, macula densa cells. Also notice at the afferent arterial, we have specialized smooth muscle right here that line uh, the endothelial cells. And these smooth muscle cells are called granular cells, also called juxtaglomerular cells. Now the exact function of these granular cells we'll hint at in this video, but we'll talk more in detail about how they regulate the diameter of this blood vessel right here, the afferent arterial, in the next video. Okay, so hopefully you have an understanding of the anatomy of the juxtaglomerular apparatus. Let's talk about what the macula densa cells do. What the macula densa cells do is they sense the flow of filtrate through the DCT by sensing the amount of sodium ions. So they are salt sensors. Now, in some pictures you'll see they actually look at potassium and chloride too, but really what they're sensing is the sodium. Okay, But we're going to say they're salt sensors. Now, Let's think about this for a second. All the filtrate has to move from the renal corpuscle, because of course you have filtrate coming from the capillaries into this capsular space, as we talked about. It then goes into the proximal convoluted tubule and into the loop of Henle, and then it eventually makes its way to the part of the DCT where we have the macula densa cells. And here's my question. Okay? What would cause there to be a lot of sodium in this area? near the macula densa cells. Why would there be a lot of sodium here? Well, it's because there's a lot of sodium in the filtrate, right? And what would cause there to be a lot of sodium in the filtrate? 
Well, the glomerulus would have to be filtering pretty good, right? It'd have to have a high degree of filtration. Because if there wasn't a high degree of filtration, then there wouldn't be a lot of filtrate, and therefore not a lot of sodium, okay? So one key here is that the reason there would be a lot of sodium in this region right here of the DCT where we have the macula densa cells, the reason there'd be a lot of sodium is if we have a high degree of filtration at the glomerulus because that filtrate's going to go through this tubule system and eventually make its way to the DCT. So really, if there's a high degree of sodium, high concentration of sodium in this area right here by the macula densa cells, then that tells you, or it tells the nephron, I should say, that you have a high glomerular filtration rate. Okay? And what would cause there to be a high glomerular filtration rate? Well, think back to what we talked about in terms of uh, increasing this filtration rate. We have to have a high net filtration pressure. Well, we have blood coming in through the afferent arterial, and this blood is coming just from the general circulation where you have a blood pressure. So logically speaking, if the blood pressure coming in here is high, then you're going to have a higher net filtration pressure, and that's going to lead to a greater glomerular filtration rate. So if we kind of backtrack, a high sodium level in this area of the DCT indicates that we've got high blood pressure. So by sensing the amount of sodium ions, that actually gives the nephron an idea of actually what the body's blood pressure is. And the key is, is that we've, if we've got high sodium ions here by the macula densa, then we have a high blood pressure. Okay? And it also means that we have a high glomerular filtration rate. Conversely, which is what we'll actually talk about first specifically, if we have a low sodium ion level near the macula densa cells, then we have a low glomerular filtration rate and overall a low blood pressure. Okay? And obviously blood pressure is something we'd like to regulate and keep within a normal range. And glomerular filtration rate is also something that we want to maintain. Because remember what the function of the filtration is. It's really to get rid of wastes from the blood. We want to be able to get rid of waste, so we don't ever want to eliminate glomerular filtration because then we wouldn't be getting rid of wastes, but we also don't want to have that filtration rate go too high and so if we have elevated sodium near the DCT macula densa cells, that means we have an elevated glomerular filtration rate and an elevated blood pressure. If we have a low sodium content near the macula densa cells, conversely, that means we have a low GFR and a low blood pressure. Okay? Now, remember what the function of filtration is. It's to get rid of wastes. Okay? And so we always want to be getting rid of that. So we don't want our GFR to go down to zero, obviously. But we also don't want the GFR to get too high. And the reason is because if the GFR gets too high, that means we have too high of a blood pressure. And too high blood pressure will cause these capillaries to burst. They're not, they don't have an infinite amount of strength. Capillaries are thin walled, so if you put the pressure up too much, these will burst and you'll get kidney failure. Because it's not just one of these will burst, most if not all of them will burst. So we need to maintain GFR and also regulate blood pressure. How does that work with the macula densa cells? Well, like I said, if we if we have elevated sodium in the area around the macula densa cells, those macula densa cells will sense that. And that indicates that you've got a greater flow of filtrate through the DCT and overall through the nephron loop, which means that your glomerular filtration rate is high, but that means that you probably have elevated blood pressure and or elevated blood volume. And blood pressure especially is something we'd like to bring back down. If blood pressure is too high, let's bring it back down. That's the principle of negative feedback. So now let's talk specifically about how the macula densa accomplishes all this. And we're first going to look at what happens when there's low filtrate sodium, low sodium around the distal convoluted tubule near the macula densa cells. Well, remember, low sodium filtrate indicates less flow of filtrate through the DCT. And overall, that means we have a low glomerular filtration rate. And so that means we have a low blood pressure. So again, this low sodium in the DCT right here near the macula densa, they sense that and it tells the nephron, hey, we've got a low blood pressure. 
Okay, we have low blood pressure probably also means or it could mean we have a low blood volume. Those are two parameters we want to bring back up to baseline because we have to regulate blood pressure. We also have to regulate blood volume because if blood volume is too low, that will cause a low blood pressure. So let's get these things back to baseline. That's the principle of negative feedback. And it's going to do this in two ways. One, it's going to sort of protect the glomerulus and maintain GFR. Okay. Again, we want to maintain GFR because we want to get rid of wastes. Okay. So let's bring the GFR back up to baseline. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to dilate the afferent arterial. Okay. We're going to talk about that mechanism um, in a few minutes, but it suffices to say for now that this afferent arterial, we're going to dilate it. Okay. So if we widen the diameter of this afferent arterial, then more blood is going to come in here. Right? More blood is going to come in here. And that's going to cause a greater net filtration pressure, and also that's going to increase glomerular filtration rate. Okay? So that gets the GFR back up to baseline, which again helps us eliminate waste as we need to. Okay? But the other thing that's going to happen, and this is going to be what regulates blood pressure and brings blood pressure back up to normal levels, is you're going to get renin release. Okay, with renin. So renin does not directly do this, and if you haven't watched the video yet, renin is part of something called the RAS system. This stands for renin angiotensin II aldosterone system. Um, renin doesn't directly increase blood pressure, but renin causes some physiological processes to occur which collectively increase blood pressure. Renin causes the production of angiotensin II, which increases blood pressure. Angiotensin II then causes the re release of aldosterone, which also increases blood pressure indirectly. So renin doesn't directly do it. But it suffices to say for now that when renin is released, you get an increase in blood pressure. Okay? So again, low filtrate sodium as sensed by the macula densa cells, means low GFR and low blood pressure. So we're going to do two changes. We're going to dilate the afferent arterial to increase glomerular filtration rate back to baseline because we want to maintain GFR. And then renin release is going to increase. And it turns out that renin release is going to be uh, due to the juxtaglomerular cells. So let's actually look and see how that occurs. This is just a very basic mechanism right here. So this could be low blood volume or low blood pressure. Over here, this is a macula densa cell. Okay? Now, by default, what the macula densa cell is going to be doing is converting arginine into this substance called nitric oxide. This is actually through the enzyme nitric oxide synthase. Okay? This nitric oxide is produced because it's an activator of this enzyme called COX-2. This is one of the isoforms of cyclooxygenase. This is an enzyme that's going to convert arachidonic acid into substances called prostaglandins. Okay? Now, why does that occur? Well, the macula densa cell is going to produce these prostaglandins as long as sodium levels are low. Okay? So as long as sodium levels are low, this process is going to occur. Prostaglandins, or PGs, are going to be produced, and they're going to be released. Now, notice the structure here, the anatomy. These macula densa cells are in very close proximity to these granular cells, that is, the juxtaglomerular cells. They're in close proximity. So, these prostaglandins will move out of the cell, that is, the macula densa cell, and they'll diffuse a very short distance to the juxtaglomerular cell, which are associated with the afferent arterial. And these prostaglandins will bind to a prostaglandin receptor. And that's going to initiate a series of processes which involve this stimulatory G protein. Stimulatory G proteins activate other proteins. So this G protein is going to come over here, and it's going to activate this enzyme called adenylate cyclase. Adenylate cyclase then is going to convert ATP into cyclic AMP. And really, the whole goal of the juxtaglomerular cell is to get that level of cyclic AMP elevated. Because if cyclic AMP is elevated, you get renin production and renin release. Okay? So as long as there's very little sodium um, that is being sensed by the macula densa cells, you're going to get prostaglandin production by the macula densa, and then that's going to lead to cyclic AMP production by the juxtaglomerular cell and subsequent renin release. Okay? And the less sodium there is, the more renin release you're going to have. So this is a graded response. Um, it's proportional to the amount of sodium, or I should say inversely. 
So the lower the sodium there is, the more renin release that you get. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense to you. Okay, so that's low sodium. Let's look at the second case, elevated sodium. So let's suppose that the macula densa cells right here are sensing more sodium. That's the opposite. That indicates you have an elevated GFR and you have elevated blood pressure. And both of those things we'd like to bring back down. We'd like to bring GFR back down because remember what I said, these capillaries don't have infinite strength. The, that is, if the blood pressure gets too high, these, the net filtration pressure will be too high and the glomerulocapillaries will burst you get damage. So bring GFR back down. Maintain it. Also maintain blood pressure by bringing it back down. Again, this is the principle of negative feedback. So more sodium in the DCT macula densa is going to indicate elevated blood pressure and or blood volume. So we're going to do some changes that are going to, again, alleviate that. The first thing is we're actually going to constrict the afferent arterial. Okay, so the afferent arterial here is going to constrict, and that's going to allow less blood in. So it's going to decrease uh, net filtration pressure, which will decrease GFR back to baseline. Maintain GFR. The other thing is renin released by the juxtaglomerular cells will decrease. Now, why does that make sense? Because renin, is a, you associate that with increasing blood pressure and blood volume. Renin does both those things indirectly. And so if we already have an elevated blood pressure and blood volume, why would we need renin? In fact, we should reduce the amount of renin or just not release it at all. Okay, so going to this slide right here, notice the difference. It's very similar to this, except we've got different processes. Okay, so in this case, we've got a high amount of sodium. Now, these macula densa cells have some proteins in their membranes. Um, this protein over here is going to allow sodium chloride and potassium influx but we're really only concerned about the sodium. So sodium is going to be sensed by these cells. It's going to influx. And there's a number of processes that are going to occur. First of all, through a process we won't talk about, whenever sodium is influxed into the macula densa cell, that's going to inhibit COX-2. Remember what COX-2 did in the case of low blood volume or low blood pressure. COX-2 allowed the production of prostaglandins, which activated the juxtaglomerular cell to release renin. So when we have high blood volume, so there's high sodium in the macula densa that's being sensed, that's going to inhibit COX-2. So even if we produce nitric oxide, we're going to have inhibition of this enzyme. So no prostaglandins. Okay. The other thing also is that when we have elevated sodium, we're going to need to export that sodium back out into the extracellular fluid out here. That's done through a sodium potassium pump, which of course is an ATPase. So in this antiport mechanism, primary active transport, ATP is hydrolyzed into ADP. And then through a couple of enzymes, ADP is first converted to AMP and then to adenosine. Adenosine is basically ATP, but without all three phosphates. So adenosine is then moved out of the macula densa cell, doesn't have to diffuse very far, and it's going to go over to the juxtaglomerular cell and bind to the adenosine receptor. There's a specific kind of receptor for adenosine. This receptor, however, controls an inhibitory G protein. Okay? So the inhibitory G protein will come over here and inhibit adenylate cyclase. So not only are we not activating the prostaglandin receptor and not getting that stimulatory G protein activated, we're also inhibiting the adenylate cyclase through the activation of this inhibitory G protein. And so my question is, do we have any cyclic AMP production? Well, no. In order to have cyclic AMP production, we'd have to have an active adenylate cyclase. But in the case of high blood pressure, high blood volume, where we've got a lot of sodium sensed by the macula densa, in the juxtaglomerular cell nearby, adenylate cyclase is inactive. So we have no cyclic AMP production or very little and very little or no renin release. Okay, And again, this is a graded response. So uh, in the case where we have low blood volume and so low sodium, the lower the sodium is, the more renin release we're going to get. In other words, we could say the lower the blood pressure, the more renin we're going to get. The higher the blood pressure, the less renin we're going to get. Okay. So this allows you to respond to uh, different degrees of blood pressure, whether it's high or low. Okay, So hopefully that makes sense. If we've got a lot of sodium in the DCT near the macula densa cells, that's going to indicate high blood pressure. A lot of sodium is high blood pressure. 
so you're not going to get any renin release there. However, if you have very little sodium sensed by the macula densa cells, then that's going to indicate low blood pressure, so you get renin released by the juxtaglomerular cells, and that'll act to bring the blood pressure back up. Now one other thing I wanted to indicate to you, and hopefully this uh, picture did the trick, notice the macula densa cell itself is not releasing the renin. The renin is released by the juxtaglomerular cell. Okay. Um, the macula densa cell has to tell the juxtaglomerular cell to release renin. Okay. Um, the same thing's kind of true of constriction versus dilation of the afferent arterial. If we look at this right here, notice it's the juxtaglomerular cells that line the afferent arterial, so they more or less control whether or not this um, afferent arterial is constricted or dilated. But if we look at this picture up here, we haven't looked at this yet, suppose we have high sodium. Okay? Um, remember, when there was elevated sodium, one of the things we wanted to do was constrict the afferent arterial. That's because blood pressure is high in this case, and we don't want to damage those capillaries, so we need to reduce the amount of blood flow to the capillaries. Notice what's happening over here in the granular cells. Okay? Whenever we have high sodium, there's also triggers to get an influx of calcium into the granular cells. Okay, so whenever you have elevated sodium, there's some triggers, and it's actually some receptors right here for adenosine, like we talked about before, that are actually going to cause calcium influx into the granular cells. Okay? And when that occurs, that triggers vasoconstriction, because the granular cells are smooth muscle cells. Okay? And so if you put calcium into a smooth muscle cell, it's going to cause constriction. Okay? If you remove that calcium, it's going to be more dilated. So if you have elevated sodium, that's going to lead to a series of events which cause influx of calcium into the granular cell. And then that will trigger it to constrict. Okay? If we had a case where there was low sodium and that was low blood pressure, we wouldn't want the granular cell constricted. We'd actually want, well, or we want the afferent arterial to be vasodilated because we need to get the glomerular filtration rate back up. And so in that case, we're not going to have calcium influx into the granular cells. Rather, there's going to be no calcium. And so by default, it's going to be more dilated to allow more blood flow into the glomerulus to maintain glomerular filtration rate. Okay? So hopefully this made some sense to you. Okay? In the next video, we're going to pick up with some more details on the juxtaglomerular cells. And what we're going to see is they actually are going to intrinsically be able to regulate renin release as well just by sensing the amount of blood flow through the afferent arterial. Okay? So join us then. Hopefully this made sense to you. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.